I'd like to say good morning to everyone and welcome you all to the Ithaca branch. My name is Pam Venuti and I'll be your moderator this morning. And I'd like to welcome you all to the Institute of Divine Metaphysical Research. This is a school and not a church. Neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh our Elohim and his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958 and since that time, we've gone about to establish branch schools throughout the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. This Ithaca branch was established in 1979. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to the Dean of the Ithaca branch, Dr. Robert White, and the host, Dr. Greg Prestis. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Heavenly Father the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The correct name of our Heavenly Father is Yahweh, which has been improperly substituted by Lord. The correct title of the Word or Son is Elohim, which has been improperly substituted by God. And the correct name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body has been erroneously substituted by Jesus or Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul filled with the Holy Spirit tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and there are God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord or God, Elohim is a divine title. That means that Elohim is the title that the creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name but it's an erroneous name, which some investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia will prove that neither the Hebrew, Greek, nor Latin languages contain any characters or letters that would produce the sound made by this letter J. The letter J didn't come into the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah, therefore making such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings of the true name of the Father and his Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Yahweh is spirit, and in, this pure spirit, in his pure spirit state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything in the universe. We have Yahweh symbolized in his pure spirit state as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We've drawn the cloud all the way around the edge of the chart and everything on the chart abides within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within this pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh knowing that man could not perceive of him in this pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim, the word or son, a super incorporeal being. That is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form appears in divine visions and is understood in divine revelations. Later on, this self-same spirit manifests in a fleshly body and walks the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. <clears throat> okay, I'm blank. Um... um now there is only one name. Thank you. Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. Therefore, the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of a Holy Name Bible. Also in the school we teach by a divine pattern of the universe. It's called a divine pattern because it's Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the wilderness of Sinai, he called Moses the top mount of Sinai and showed him his tabernacle pattern in a vision. He instructed Moses to build one exactly as he had seen it in the wilderness. 
It consisted of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments making up the one tabernacle pattern. Now also in the school we go about to show proof how that everything is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and how that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now in this school we have 10 primary constitutional aims and objectives, and they are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, nationality, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, both modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose, dispensations, and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating a mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained. There is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of a mortal glorification and a newer state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is to speak the truth. And this morning, we will have a prayer to dedicate today's lecture by Dr. Frank DeMassey. That will be followed by a musical rendition by Dr. Judith Turner from our Tampa class. And the scripture, which is Romans 16, I'm sorry, Romans 1, 16 through 20, that will be read by Dr. Reba Zahar. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, morning, Frank. Everyone want to bow their hearts and minds, get all the thoughts of the flesh away for a couple hours. Mm -hmm. Just be thankful and joyful that we realize and understand the grace that's been bestowed upon us that he saw fit to call us. And what greater honor is it than to stand before and to testify of the very beautiful things that Yahshua has shown us. Allow us to always, always love the truth. Allow us to always give you the glory and allow us to hold each other's arms up. We ask this in your son's name, Yahshua, the Messiah, may we all say. Okay, this song is a song that is not recorded anywhere, but um, it's a song I wrote, and um, Lisa Zizi and Jennifer Marshall have a better rendition than what I'm going to give to you. So um, seek out their rendition, all right? <laughs> but here I go. And, and Carl Emler, this is me coming home from Madison on Highway P. D. Traveling this evening, the direction is home blue purple, scarlet dress, the horizon, a reflection of a journey. Son to humbly receive the grace. I the will to express all I want to say, but the words they stumble at my feet. All the same, I thank you for lighting. 
my way and for giving me a purpose to live. A purpose to live. Or I walk this morning in turn to see it dawn Yahweh sun expressing glory across the sky. A reflection of a gift I've been graced to know Yahshua, the resurrector, the fruits of life. I the will to express all I want to say, but the world they stumble at my feet. All the same, I thank you for lighting my way and for giving me a purpose to live. A purpose to breathe. What a gift I never thought it possible at all. I hope I never know before when I'm done. This morning's uh, scripture reading will be Romans, the first chapter, verses 16 through 20. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Yahshua, for it is the power of Yahweh unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For therein is the righteousness of Yahweh revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of Yahweh is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, for Yahweh hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and supernal nature, so that they are without excuse. Thank you. For our first speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Keith Payne. Can you folks hear me? Yes. Yep. All right. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, you know, as I was reading this along with the scripture, the first verse says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Yahshua, the Messiah. And um, I just wanted to think about that for a few minutes. Um, you know, this is a little bit of a personal testimony, but when I was a young kid, my mother decided I needed to have a little religion in my life. So she sent me off to a Bible school and, and um, we learned things there. And it was there that I, you know, 
was offered the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as my personal savior. And I went through the motions and did all that. And I got to tell you, it, it just didn't stick. Um, Cause I went on to grow up and do things that, you know, it just wasn't real to me then. And, and this class, the subject matter that we're dealing with here in this class it does stick. If you give it the opportunity and if you pay heed to it, it will positively transform your life. It will positively transform your nature mm -hmm. and it will do you nothing but good if you take it to heart. Right. But that's a, that's a long haul. Um, we start off and it's like, how do you believe in something you can't see? It's one thing to believe in Yahweh, that there is a God, that he is real, and that he actually exists. Um, and then it's another thing to believe that that supernal nature expressed itself into the world as the Messiah. But then, you know, the third and final phase of that belief process is you have to see that divine nature taking on shape and taking on form right within you. And it's a process to, to come to a knowledge and understanding that the great creator of heaven and earth is personally working with you and causing you to transform into a beloved son. Um, and that's what this class is all about to me. It's not about keeping on intellectual facts and running correlations and seeing the Holy Spirit manifest in somebody else. Mm -hmm. It's about coming to a profound knowledge and a profound understanding and seeing that Holy Spirit working in your life, causing you to change and to become a beloved son of the Most High. That's what this class is about to me. Now, having said that, we have to start somewhere. And so how is it that you believe in something you can't see? Um, that's... That's one of the reasons this scripture has always been one of my favorites, because this scripture, if we can jump down to verse 19, and can you read that again, Reba? Sure. Because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, for Yahweh has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and supernal nature so that they are without excuse. Thank you. So you see, it starts off saying that because that which may be known of Yahweh, or in the King James Version, it says God. So it's when something may be known, it's, it's that which we have permission to know. Um, right. It's not that we will come to a complete and total knowledge of all things of our Heavenly Father. Because Yahweh, by nature, is infinite. And there's no way in one lifetime we can come to know everything. There's no way in seven ages and dispensations we can come to know everything. It's only what he is allowing us to know at this time that we we can come to a knowledge and understanding of but really it that's what this class is all about is coming to know and believe that yahweh is real um let's go to our aims i just want to re-emphasize the first aim can someone read that please to help you okay go ahead Reed. to help you Find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. See, 
to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. The, the key word in that sentence to me is really is, because we in this school are encouraged to go out and investigate other religions, other philosophies, and I do that. I, I you know, watch videos and I, I do this thing with a group of Buddhist, uh, not, not necessarily Buddhist people, but um, they're, they're mostly yoga people, but they do this thing called dinner and Dharma where they watch a video and discuss some spiritual teaching. And it's interesting to see what other people believe and what other religions teach mm -hmm. because you know, if, if all you see is what we're talking about down here, you're only getting a little view of what's going on. So I would encourage everyone to take the time to investigate other religions, investigate other philosophies and, and, you know, investigate science. I mean, the more you look into these things, the more it will bear witness that what we're teaching here is true. Um, right. So, so it, it, it helps to, to, to look into these things. Um, but it's not what we imagine our creator to be like. It's what he really is like that we're concerned about. Um, let's get that scripture. There's a scripture that says, and this is life eternal, um, that we might know him and Yahshua, the Messiah, whom he has sent. I'm paraphrasing. John 17. That? Could be, yeah. You want it right at one? Um, sure. John 17, <coughs> one. These words spake Yahshua and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true Elohim and Yahshua the Messiah, whom thou hast sent. Thank you. So you see, eternal life is to know Yahweh and Yahshua as they really are. And it's, it's not just a shallow intellectual thing. It's not knowing about. But really, it's, it's when it becomes real within you that you know and you understand and you believe that Yahshua is real and that Yahweh is working his purpose throughout the creation. That's when this thing starts to have some power. Um, you know, you can just have book knowledge and it's empty and shallow. You know, it's really... It's got to be an experience that you have within your own self. Right. And that experience is positively life-changing and transformative. Um, and that's why I keep coming to class, because we grow in grace. We don't get this thing all at once, like Dr. Kinley. He had his vision and his testimony when he uh, came out of the experience. He's, he told his wife, I will never be the same person. Um, and that's, that's, I, I bear witness to that. This class will change you. Um, the, the frustrating part is we get it piece by piece here a little and there a little, but it is a work in progress and we will be changed. Um, let's get that. There's another scripture that, um, that Yahweh um, will finish a work that he began. I'm, I'm paraphrasing again, and I'm sorry, I'm terrible with scriptures. So if if you could find that, I would appreciate that. Eighth chapter of Romans. Yeah, let's try that. Thank you. You got a verse on that? Um, hang on. Try Romans nine twenty eight. I think what okay. Keith wants is Philippians one and six. <laughs> I'm okay. So all those other scriptures are good too. Yeah. 
Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Yahshua the Messiah. Yeah, that, that's pretty much what I was on to, Greg. Thank you. Um, you know, you come to class and, and you start to see things, and it is a humbling experience. Um, and you will, you will be humbled by this class, and you will be chastised by this class, and that's all good. That's in the purpose. Um, Yahweh chastises every son that he loveth. And if you are not chastised, then you're not a son. But you come to class and it just, you realize how far short of the high calling you come. You realize that you, you, you will come to a point where you have to say within yourself, Yahshua, I need you to do this for me because I think it's human nature. We come here and we think, well, I've got this. I'll study hard. I'll, you know, well, if, if, if that's what you're doing, you're not getting the real thing. You're getting you trying to fulfill the law that you're trying to fulfill. And that will get you nowhere in the long run. But when Yahshua takes over and causes you to be a, a new creature, that's a very powerful thing. But it's a humbling thing. And you will go through some things when you're in this class. Um, but anyway, let's get back to the, the scripture reading, Romans 1, 19 and 20, because we have to start somewhere. And how is it you can understand something that's invisible? Um, if we look up to the, uh, the top left corner of this chart that Greg has on the screen, Yahweh is pure spirit. And in that pure spirit state, Yahweh is inscrutable and incomprehensible. That means you can't study Yahweh because you can't see Yahweh. And what Dr. Kinley said is pure spirit just doesn't cooperate with the five senses. You, you, it's completely abstract to us. We can't see, smell, touch, taste, or hear pure spirit. So how is it you're going to come to a knowledge and an understanding and a belief that Yahweh is real, unless Yahweh shows it to you. So in this, this part of the chart, you can see that there are words, wisdom, knowledge, intelligence, love, justice, beauty, power, strength, and foundation. Those are all divine attributes that Yahweh is. It's not that Yahweh has knowledge. It's not that Yahweh has wisdom. It's not that Yahweh has love. But that is what Yahweh is. That is what spirit is. And that is what we're here to talk about. Understanding the divine nature. Now, you can't understand that in its pure spirit state. Take love, for example. Um, a mother might have a love for the child, but until that mother manifests that love for the child, it's not recognizable. You wouldn't understand love until it's manifested. Same thing with knowledge. You can have all kinds of knowledge, but if you don't share that knowledge and you don't put that knowledge into work, it's unexpressed. It's not going to be understood. So that's, that's what this Yahweh, pure spirit, we, we can't understand that in its pure spirit state. But what we can do is understand what Yahweh has revealed to us. And how does Yahweh reveal that to us? Well, what Yahweh does is he takes on shape and takes on form right within himself as Yahweh Elohim. That's the word or son, the 
incorporeal, the super incorporeal being can be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelation. Now, that's what may be, may be known of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. It's what he has expressed to us. It's what he is allowing us to see. And that is Yahweh Elohim, that intermediate state of existence of spirit. But then that self-same spirit manifests itself and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah and took on a physical body. So as I was saying before, you know, this, this is a way of understanding things. Yahweh has a pattern. Let's go back up to the Elohim part, Greg. See, if, and if you look at the very top of this chart, it says Elohim is the archetype or the original pattern of the universe. Well, that means that Elohim the universe was made by Elohim. And I mean that two ways. He was the creator that created it, but he is the pattern that it follows. So you see, how can we understand any of this stuff? Well, let's go back to Exodus, the 24th chapter, where the tabernacle pattern is given to Moses. If you look at this chart, you'll see how that on Mount Sinai, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up onto the mountain, and they saw Yahweh Elohim. And that's what we're going to read about here in, in Exodus. 24, verse 9. Then went up Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the Elohim of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw Elohim and did eat and drink. Thank you. So you see what we're... What we're doing with this chart, this chart is a pictorial illustration of what's in the Bible. And what's in the Bible is an account of the vision that Moses received atop Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. So you see how that Yahweh is showing himself to Moses and the 73 elders of Israel. That's what's happening on the left side of the chart. Over on the right side of the chart, you see John on the island of Patmos, and he is seeing the same vision from a different perspective. He's on top of a mountain. We call it an island because it's surrounded by water, signifying the, it's after the outpouring of the Spirit. But you see, that vision is the same vision that Moses saw. So Moses and John are seeing the same vision. And Dr. Kinley, his vision was the same vision. And what Dr. Kinley said about his vision, he said, you could take the vision of John and Moses and put it right down inside the vision that he had. So you see, it's not a different vision. It's the same vision. Some people are given a little, some people are given a lot, but just be thankful you're seeing the vision. And even more so, be thankful you're getting the revelation of what that vision is about. Because you see, it's all about coming to a knowledge and an understanding of how Yahweh really is and actually exists. And a component of that is understanding that he is putting his spirit in us and causing us to be transformed. That's That's... I just can't emphasize that enough because it's not an external thing. Really, the, the nature of what we're doing in this class is about 100% internal. It's not an external thing. And um, it, it will transform you. Um, so anyway, getting back to this. Um, they saw Elohim and he had hands, feet, and a body. 
you know, you, you, you read theological books and things, and they will say that man created God in his image, meaning that because man has hands, feet, and a body, we have anthropomorphized our concept of the deity as having hands, feet, and a body. Well, really, in the, it's the exact opposite. It's because Yahweh Elohim had hands, feet, and a body. Man being made in the likeness and image of Yahweh Elohim, we have hands, feet, and a body. Now, see, if you look at this, you'll see how that Yahweh Elohim is standing there. And I want to, I want to just make this clear and, and make this statement. It is one spirit operating his purpose and it is not a trinity it is actually a unity mm -hmm. yahweh yahweh elohim and yashua are one what we're talking about when we use those different names in that title is we're differentiating the manifestation that that spirit is taking on so it's a threefold pattern and if you see this you're on your way to understanding a great deal of what Yahweh is all about so if you look next to it just right of the Elohim figure there is the tabernacle pattern that tabernacle is a manifestation an allegory a type and shadow or an example, those are just some of the words I'm using to ex get the point across. It is a pattern revealing the nature, the supernal nature of the great creator of heaven and earth. Just like we were reading there in Romans 1, 19 and 20, so that we are without excuse for knowing something about our creator. Now, Yahweh, has manifest himself throughout the creation. Dr. Kinley, in his, uh, one of my favorite transcripts from him, he wrote, um, or he, it was a class, and there's a transcript where he says that um, Yahweh is expressing himself in every cosmic phase of nature. Um, and when you pause to ponder that, it, it will just blow your mind away. But in every cosmic phase of nature, let's just take the simplicity of this thing. It, remember how I said it's a, it's a unity, but that there are, there's Yahweh pure spirit, Yahweh Elohim, the visionary shape and form, and Yahshua the Messiah, the Holy Spirit manifest in or out of a physical body. So you see, it's a one, two, three. Well, if you look at this tabernacle pattern, it consists of a court roundabout, a holy place, and a most holy place. So it's a one, two, three. If you look at an atom, an atom is an electron, proton, and neutron. So it's a one, two, three. If you look at a cell, a cell body has a nucleus and a nucleolus. So there's a one, two, three. You know, you, we live in a world that's three dimensions. You have length, width, and depth. You have liquid, solid, and gas. You know, um, you look at your finger. You have three segments to a finger, and yet it's one finger. You look at your arm. You have a hand, a forearm, and an upper arm. So there's three segments, but it's one arm. You look at your leg. You have a foot a calf and a thigh, but it's one leg. You look at your body, you have an abdominal cavity, a chest cavity, and a head cavity. So it's a one, two, three, but it's one body. And we can go on and on how that everything breaks down into this simple. And, and I just want to point out, simplicity is good. You know, I, I often joke with my friends that I'm simple minded, but it's the simplicity of this pattern that begins to get through to you and make you understand how profound it really is. So it's a one, two, three. 
And I just want to say this again for emphasis. It's what we want. It's a threefold pattern in our understanding. We want to know that Yahweh is real. We want to know that Yahshua is real. But what we really want to see is that Yahshua is real in us. So there's a one, two, three. Mm -hmm. So you see, it's just a never ending breakdown of one, two, three. Now let's go back to the tabernacle and zoom in a little bit on that court roundabout. So you see the court roundabout has a three, three articles or three furnishings right there. You have the brass altar, you have the, bra um, the brass laver, and the cup of holy anointing oil signifying the Holy Spirit. Now you see that Holy Spirit, and I just, I, this, I want to just emphasize this was poured over the high priest and was as a quickening. It's a type and shadow of the Holy Spirit, that holy anointing oil is, that caused that priest to officiate properly in the tabernacle. So you see one, two, three. It's the three furnishings. You go up into the holy place, there's the lampstand, the altar, and the showbread, the table of showbread. One, two, three. You go into the most holy place. You have the Ark of the Covenant and the two figures of the archangels. It's a one, two, three pattern. So you see, it's three upon three upon three. But look at that tabernacle pattern and what the purpose of that pattern is, is for Yahweh to dwell among his people. That was what that tabernacle was made for. It also happens to be a very good pattern and a very good type and shadow and a very good example breaking down the divine nature so that we can understand it. But again, getting back to that holy anointing oil, it's the type and shadow of the Holy Spirit that that high priest needed to have to officiate properly in there. Now, we can correlate if we had time, but I, I think Bob just said I had five minutes, right? Um, you know, that all correlates to our body. No, it didn't. It, oh, you didn't? I thought I heard a five minute thing. Um, sorry. Um, well, let's just work with this a little more then if we have a little more time. Um, okay, the, the holy anointing oil is a quickening. And let's, let's get this because um, there, I want to get how the, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Can you get that in the Bible, please? First Corinthians 15, what is it, about 45? I'm not sure. I rely heavily on you folks to help me with that because that's yeah, just not in my brain. Uh well, I can read uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and 45. Okay. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So you see, how be it, keep going. Howbeit that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the master from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have bore the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Hey, okay, thank you. So you see, that's... That's talking about Yahshua being the last Adam, the last man. And he is a quickening spirit. A quickening spirit means a life-giving spirit. When, when something is quickened, it, it, it's made alive. Um, you know, this is just a silly little example, but that little part of your fingernail is called the quick. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever 
pinched yourself or cut yourself there, you know it's alive because it hurts like heck. But so the quick, the quickening that we're talking about is that spirit causing us to have life. Um, you know, we, we have a physical life and, you know, we, we've all come to understand this, that we came into this world with a carnal mind, just physically focused on everything. Uh, we were interested in, you know, creature comforts, basically. Um, and physically, you know, aware of things, but we have not been always spiritually aware. And that's, that's a big part of what this class is, is transforming your nature and becoming more and more aware of the spiritual things. And when you do that, you realize that we are now in the world, but we are not of the world. That carnal nature that we had at the beginning is that, you know, was insufficient. You know, it says in the Bible that that's death. Um, to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is to have life. So you see, we're, we're working with that spirit of Yahshua in you, causing you to be alive in a way that you were never alive before. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the essence of what we're talking about in this class. Um, everything else is just a way of explaining it and coming to understand it and coming to know it and coming to believe it. Um, <clears throat> I just want to get this scripture too. Let's go to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, 12 and 1. Hebrews 12 and 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto okay. Joshua. Yep, keep going. The author and finisher of our faith. Yeah. Okay. Yahshua is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's going to finish it. Um, keep going. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of Yahweh. Okay. Thank you. But what it the emphasis I wanted to get there is we are compassed about by a great cloud of witnesses. Um, you know, so much of what we get into this class is just looking at the witnesses. Um, witnesses are important because they will convince you of something that you can't see. And that's what all this business of looking at the tabernacle and breaking down how that works and looking at the holy anointing oil and seeing what ingredients were in that and how that works and seeing how that is ultimately all pointing to the Holy Spirit operating in us. Now, that, you know, a lot of this stuff it's not just piling on intellectual facts. It's not just correlating things because we sound good when we correlate things. It's ultimately just looking at the witnesses and examining this thing until the point where we become absolutely convinced that Yahweh is real that Yahshua is real and that Yahshua is really working within us. That, that's what the purpose of all these witnesses that we get into is all about. It's not to show how smart we are or to, to prove someone else wrong. It's really just to prove that Yahweh is real and that he is working his purpose in his creation according to his plan. So, um, where were we here? We were looking at the tabernacle pattern. Can we zoom a little bit more in on that, Greg? Thank you. 
I appreciate Greg's skill at following the speakers and zooming in on the charts as well as he does. It's, a, it's something I think we can't take for granted. Now, you see that holy anointing oil was poured over the priest and it, it served as a quickening. And in our physical bodies, that correlates to the adrenaline. Like if you look, we'll just do a quick line upon line port upon point view of this because um, it, it's, it's good to review these things. And if someone sees this for the first time, it's important for them to see it in its simplicity. But you have in the tabernacle, a square seven and a half foot brass square altar where they consumed the sacrifices. But over in your human body, you have a square principle there with an ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon that is where you, and, and then there's a grating on this altar, you have convoluted within your large intestines, your small intestines, and that's where the food that you eat is actually consumed. So you have a consuming or a burning on that altar. You have a consuming or a burning on your altar within your own body. And you have a cleansing principle. See, there's a cleansing with water and the laver there. And you have your kidneys, which cleanse your blood. And you have a principle of water there because that's where the urine that cleanses your blood, all those um, impurities are then flushed away. See, but then right on top of those kidneys, you have your adrenal glands. And those adrenal glands are part of your body's stress response. When you are caused, called upon to do something extraordinary, those things kick into action and your body is capable of doing things that it normally cannot do in its normal everyday resting state. So you see, that's what that Holy Spirit is being expressed in the cup of holy anointing oil. It's being manifest in your adrenal glands. And see, those are just types and shadows of the Holy Spirit, the real deal that we're talking about. But you can't understand the real deal unless you can see those things broken down in the tabernacle mm -hmm. and in your body. Um, and then let's just go through the tabernacle quickly. You go through a door into the most holy place. Well, you have a diaphragm separating your abdominal cavity from your chest cavity, just like you had a veil separating the court roundabout from the, the holy place. And there was only one way to get through there. Well, you have one hole through your diaphragm, and that's how you, your body has the, um, the arteries and your spinal cord and everything go down through that diaphragm through that one hole. So there's one way through that diaphragm, there's one way through that veil. And that's pointing ultimately to the one way to get from the state we find ourselves in now to a heavenly state. And that's through Yahshua. He says, I am the door. Well, you see, that's that one door, that one portal, that one way to get from the court roundabout into the holy place. And there you'd find the lampstand, which had seven branches lit from the dark parts of the day. So there was never any darkness in that tabernacle. Right. It was a flickering. And a, well, look it over in your body. You have your heart. And above your heart, you have a seven-branched aortic arch. That seven-branched aortic arch is in principle showing you the same things that that seven branch candlestick is. That candlestick burned oil and it flickered. Well, you have a pulse generated from your heart in that aortic arch. So you have a pulsating or a flickering going on there. And then look in the anatomy books and you'll find out that the hollow part of your veins and arteries are called lumens. And right. the word lumen means light. So you have a principle of light with your aortic arch. You have a principle of light with that lampstand. So you see how this is starting to work line upon line, precept upon precept. Yahweh is revealing something to us being manifest by the tabernacle pattern and by the 
your body and ultimately through, like I said earlier, every cosmic phase of nature. So you see, that's that lampstand in a brief, very brief way. Then you go to the table of showbread. Well, you see, your table of showbread was a sustenance for the priest. There were 12 loaves of bread there. Well, just like your heart. And again, if you get into the old medical books and, in to, and medical encyclopedias, they'll refer to it as the tables of your heart. Well, the tables of your heart correspond to that table of showbread. And you'll find out that that table was a gold vessel with a double gold crown around the edges of it. Well, you have two coronary arteries that wrap around your heart. And that's a double crown going around the tables of your heart, just like there was a double crown going around that table of showbread. So you see line upon line, precept upon precept, it starts to become more and more detailed to the point where when you've been studying this for a long time, you can say it is polytechnically detailed how that everything is pointing to Yahshua and it's every cosmic phase of nature showing you something about Yahshua. Now, then you come to your, the altar that they uh, burnt incense at. Well, that corresponds to your lungs. You see, you have your lungs, there's a burning going on there or in principle of oxidation where external air is brought in and ex internal gases are exhaled. So you have an intercession going on with your lungs just like you have an intercession going on at that altar of incense where they offered up prayers. And look, they prayed in the name of Yahweh. So is it any wonder that when you breathe, you breathe the name of Yahweh? You breathe in, it's Yah. And when you breathe out, it's So you're breathing Yahweh. Every time you breathe, you're declaring that name. And it's a principle of intercession or prayer going on continually with your body. Now, again, there's another blue, purple, and scarlet veil. That blue, purple, and scarlet veil divides the holy place from the most holy place. Well, you have a natural division between your head and your chest, and that is your neck. But well, how is the colors blue, purple, and scarlet manifested there? Well, you see, it's blue, purple, and scarlet because you have venal blood, which is blue, denoted blue. Arterial is red. And then you have your thyroid gland there, which uses iodine, which there's a principle of purple with the, the thyroid and the iodine. So you have a blue, purple, and scarlet veil separating your head from your chest, just like there was a blue, purple, and scarlet veil separating the holy place from the most holy place. And then I neglected to say that that's also a blue, purple, and scarlet veil with your diaphragm, how that you have arterial red blood, you have venal blue blood, and you have lots of capillaries because it's a muscle that never stops working. And that muscle, so there's that principle of red and blue makes purple. So a blue, purple, and scarlet veil swaying in the wind out here in the court roundabout, just like your diaphragm sways in the wind when you breathe. You breathe in and out. It's like it's swaying in the wind. See, but then you get into the most holy place. That most holy place is at the Ark of the Covenant and the two angels. Well, you see, there also was a cloud in there because the, the high priest would carry an incense or burning incense and that would fill this whole tabernacle with a cloud. So you have a cloud between the wings of the archangel and that's where Yahweh says, I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. But you see, you have a brain. Your brain is not the seat of your consciousness. It's not what causes you to have consciousness, that I mean, but it is a physical representation of what we're talking about here. So you see, you have motory and sensory, just like you had Michael, a warrior, and Gabriel, a messenger. You see, you have two motory and sensory responses in your brain. In your brain, you know, it is a very complicated thing. And there, the, 
there's more we can get into this, but that would be another lecture. Um, so your brain is gray and white like a cloud, just like there was a cloud here. So you see line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, we're starting to see how that this tabernacle built in the wilderness of Sinai so that the creator could dwell among his people is in principle duplicated in your body so that your creator can dwell in you. Um, the Apostle Paul said this, he said, what, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and ye are not your own? So you see, we are, our bodies are a temple for the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. You see, and that's what this class is all about, is coming to a knowledge and coming to an understanding that Yahshua can and will be in you doing things personally with you. That's, that's what the essence of this class is all about. So um, let's just go back to the Moses chart here a little bit. Five minutes, Keith. Oh, okay. We'll wrap it up in five minutes then. So you see, just like there was um, this tabernacle in the wilderness, that pattern also applies to the migration of the children of Israel. Well, how's that? Well, there's a principle of death when they offered up a sacrifice on that altar. Well, down here in Egypt, there was a principle of death. There was the death of the firstborn. And there, so there's a death there. Then they went into the wilderness of Sinai. Well, that's like the, the holy place of the migratory trek. So you see, you have a principle of um, all the same things that were there in that tabernacle are manifested in the wilderness. There was never any light, or excuse me, never any darkness because the cloud was a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. So there was illumination or light in that wilderness, just like there was light at all times in that holy place. Um, and then Canaan's land is the promised land, which correlates to the um, most holy place in the tabernacle. But what I just want to leave you with is the understanding and ultimately, I want you to come to the knowledge and the belief that Yahweh is working with us. He is working to put his spirit in us and that we are the tabernacle for the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit now. Um, I can't say it any simpler than that. We can talk about other witnesses all we want. But really, that's the essence of what we have to come to understand is that Yahshua is in us now. And that is our only hope of glory. So with that, I'm going to say thank you very much. I hope you got something out of that. Um, and I appreciate all of you folks coming, zooming in. It's, uh, it's been a real, a really nice experience getting to know you guys all over Zoom. Um, someday, I hope to see you personally and close up. Um, but thank you all for everything you bring to the table. Um, everybody, I appreciate each and every one of you and, and whatever personal gifts Yahshua has given you, I am thankful for that because you share it willingly and that is a beautiful thing. So again, thank you so much and I'll turn it back to the moderator. Thank you, Keith. Karen, can you uh, please read and help read, but we don't want to tire her out. Yeah, I, I already said I would. Okay, great. Um, and for our second speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Shannon Brewster from Oceanside, California. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is a little surprise, but um, I really appreciate having the opportunity to be here with you this morning and happy and glad to have something to say about this great teaching. I really appreciate it and enjoyed the comments of the previous speaker, um, really thoroughly just covered the waterfront in terms of how the creator, our creator Yahweh has gone to such great lengths to make himself known and understood to us um, through our experiences and the things that he allows us to see and understand about him as he's expressed himself through the creation and right down to the structure and the function of our own physical body. Um, you know, and as we read in the scripture lesson this morning, 
so much so that we're without an excuse. Um, you know, if you, you can choose you know, not to believe your Bible, you can choose to not believe a, a lot of things as it would appear, right? But um, the one thing that each and every one of us have that we can't deny is a physical body. And mm -hmm. when you really start to wrap your mind around what is being expressed, um, this is, uh, is just quite unbelievable, you know, that a man 3,500 years ago went up, went up the top of a mountain uh, and had a vision and a revelation of the creator who showed him how he had made the universe according to a pattern and then told that man to come down and build a physical tabernacle so that those that hadn't had that experience of being up on top of that mountain could then come to an appreciation of what Moses had seen in that vision and they could lay their eyes on this physical building that honestly looked like nothing, right? I mean, from the outside was ram skin and badger skin dyed red, if I'm not mistaken, right. um, would have been beaten by the elements and they were carrying that thing around in um, the wilderness of Sinai. It would have been covered in dirt and sand and um, you can just imagine that uh, that thing didn't look that great. And, you know, Greg's done a great job of kind of zooming in on here because when they went over into Canaan's land, they did take that tabernacle with them um, and they pitched it on Mount Zion. But eventually Yahweh gave um, David the um, uh, instructions or the, or the blueprint or the um, 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 direction, if you could put it that way, to build a temple. And they took all of those um, um, <laughs> vessels that Keith just went into and they moved them into the, tap, into the temple. And eventually, so that, that's why you have both of them side by side there because um, they didn't initially have the temple until they had been over there for some time. And I forget about how long that was. But um, just pause and consider the fact that there's something monumental that was presented this morning because 3,500 years ago for a man to have come down with a pattern, uh, geez, how can I say this clearly? I mean, Keith did such a great job of just expressing um, himself in simplicity, but um, I don't know if we could just go back real quick and pick up um, over in the 24th fourth chapter of Exodus and down towards the end um, and then also in the 25th chapter because when our founder came to us and told us that he had had a divine vision and revelation in the year 1931 and he said that he challenged us not to believe him because he said it don't just believe me because I said that I had a vision and a revelation but I, I but make me prove it until you're satisfied right and Dr. Kinley didn't go and write his own book to come up with the proof of his vision. He went right into the Bible that the world is using and used the Bible and the creation to prove, as he put it, the unerring accuracy, the divine authenticity, and the absolute infallibility of the Bible and showed how that the creator had laid down all the evidence of himself right there in that book. And the whole world had looked over it. And it was Dr. Kinley, through this vision and revelation, that pointed out to us that there was a pattern in existence. And he didn't even make that up. That's right there in the book. It's almost right. mind-blowing that the whole world, with all their studying and all of their um, scholarly aptitude and establishing, I mean, they go out and, you, and establish whole institutions and organizations dedicated to understanding this book and they've poured over this bible for hundreds and not it, literally thousands of years men have spent their whole lives talking and well studying this book and the fact that moses came down with a pattern is not something that you see came off from the mount, mount sinai with a pattern of the universe you don't hear that taught anywhere else <laughs> and 
I, so just grab that for me real quick, just to back up what I just said. Exodus 25, 8 and 9. Mm -hmm. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. So this is not some wild, fantastic tale of ideology, as Dr. Kinley would talk about, that Dr. Kinley made this thing up that this tabernacle that Moses got on top of Mount Sinai was a pattern of the universe. It's written right there in the text. Right. After the pattern of the tabernacle, this tabernacle is a pattern that all things were made by. And as Keith so eloquently said this morning, that this is something that you can just look at and have undeniable, irrefutable evidence of the existence of a creator that you can't see with your physical eyes. You know, and we, we've, we could go into detail uh, ad infinitum about all of the things that are laid up here in this tabernacle. I mean, what happened this morning was just scratching the surface of the principles and the types and the shadows that are laid down here in this tabernacle that literally just steamroll over the entire Bible and right down to the structure and the function of your own physical body. And as, as we looked at this morning, the ultimate goal of that was that the creator said that he was going to dwell among them. Did you read that just now, Reba? Yeah. That was what you just read, right? Could you just repeat that real quick? And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The point the ultimate point here is that when they made this tabernacle in this wilderness, the creator of the universe got in it. He dwelled in that tabernacle, in a physical building. Now, um, get over in um, Leviticus 16 and 2, just to kind of uh, show that a little bit more closely. Leviticus 16 mm -hmm. and 2. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times, into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, mm -hmm. which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. See, he, the creator himself appeared right within the cloud that was over that mercy seat. Right. One day of the year, they were the, the high priest was allowed to go up into that most holy place and see through, um, you know, that, that well, what they call the flash of the Shekinah, right? Where right. Um, when he completed, completed the order of service with the, um, on the Day of Atonement, the offering up of the sacrifice, and went up into the most holy place with blood and sprinkled that blood on the um, Ark of the Covenant, at the conclusion of that, he would see Yahweh appear there, right there between the, ark, the, 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 the wings of those two angels in the cloud. And that signified that um, the children of Israel had been forgiven for their sins for that whole year. And when that happened, there was a blowing of the trumpet and there was uh, great joy in the camp. People, um, that was a, a great celebration because of what that signified um, in terms of Yahweh's purpose and what he was carrying out with those people back there. And it was called the Day of Atonement. And we had a blackboard, we'd highlight this, that you know, Dr. Kinley would, was really good about us trying to break down words, understanding you know, lexicography and, and etymological definitions of words, where their origin was, and even helping us come to a better appreciation sometimes in just the way that the you know, words are structured, right? But atonement could be broken down to at one mint. Right. And I'm just trying to you know, go a little bit, you know, just continue right on where Keith left off, because that's the point of all of this. But we come into the world with a, a satanic spirit, a carnal mind, and a physical body. And the reality of it is that the, the world has gone about to try to worship this creator, which was already said this morning, who is spirit, with 
uh, a natural, physical, carnal mind. So when you go back and you read this book and you think that, well, you know, I'm going to read the Bible and I'm going to understand, I'm, come, I'm going to come to an understanding about God, right? Well, guess what? You can't do that uh, because the whole book has been sealed. You can't just open it up and, and, and come to an understanding of what it is that you're reading. Right. I want to get, because um, this has been something that's kind of resonating with me lately, um, over in Romans, the 10th chapter, I think around the ninth verse. Um, but let me, let me try to tighten this up a little bit. Um, you think that, you know, you're just going to jump in here and read these things and understand these things. And that's, that's not the case, first and foremost. Um, but the second point that I wanted to make is that um, the world, by and large, goes in and they read things in this book and they think it's about me and it's about how I'm supposed to go and try to worship my creator. So um, Christianity, by and large, has gone in and read what they, the, these, um, these books and they've tried to extract out and reformulate a way of worshiping their creator modeled after the things that they read about over here that we just were into this morning in Exodus. As an example, they see Moses was told to build a building, right? He was told to build a tabernacle. God said he would dwell in the tabernacle. So then you get the bright idea that you're going to go build a church and you're going to tell people that God lives in the church. But it doesn't work that way. And that kind of brings us into, can you just jump over real quick? And I know I'm all into a bunch of things. Uh, but the ages and dispensations chart, and I'll just, you know, say it like this, that it is an absolute necessity for you to understand that there is ages and dispensations in operation. Mm -hmm. And that um, the reason for that is that what's valid in one age isn't necessarily valid in another age. Right. So you have to know and understand the start and the stop of ages and dispensations. Right. And we didn't know anything about that till we came into the school that Yahweh had ordered his purpose by seven ages and dispensations. And so by and large, the average person picks up the Bible, thinks that this is about me and I'm just going to read it and then I can extract and do with it what I want and never even dawns on you that what you're reading about if you don't put it into its proper place in the ages and dispensations, you don't even know how it applies. Mm -hmm. So you read about Moses building a, a, a tabernacle. And then when your pastor tells you that he needs you to donate money to build a church so God can dwell in it and you can come down and worship him in a church, that seems plausible to you because you read about it in the Bible, mm -hmm. but completely missed out on the fact that there's that because there's ages and dispensations and you never pause to consider, well, what age did Yahweh tell Moses to build the tabernacle? What age was it that he told David and had Solomon to build that temple? Mm -hmm. Because there's been a change of ages, right? Right. So, and, uh, and I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't have time to, you know, go into this in any great depth, but, when the age changed, then it was no longer um, appropriate in Yahweh's purpose for you to build buildings and think that he lives in them, right? Mm -hmm. That's why, because I mean, in, if you don't have an appreciation of these ages of dispensations, you'll be confused out of your, your mind, right? Because right. In, in one place, he's telling Moses, he's telling, um, you know, Noah to build an ark, telling Moses to build a tabernacle, he's telling David to build a temple. Mm -hmm. And then you read, you jump over into Acts and you read over in um, Acts, uh, the 17th chapter, I believe it is. And Paul yeah. goes up on Mars Hill and he says, Yahweh, who made the world and all things therein dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Right. What happened? There was a change of an age, but you didn't know anything about ages and dispensation. So you don't know how to properly apply what it is that you're reading in the book. So. Anyway, um, do you have that in Romans, the 10th chapter? Yeah. You want it right at nine? Um, I don't remember exactly where. What is it? How does it start? Uh, okay, nine. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Yahshua is the Messiah 
and shall believe in thine heart that Yahweh Elohim hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Does that go on to say how can they believe on him? Um, yeah, that's um, more. Hold on. Uh, uh, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Okay, so I just want to thank you for reading that. So just wanted to stop there and, and just say, look, we had a man that came to us and said that he had had received a divine vision and revelation from Yahweh himself. And this is a Ripley's Believe It or Not, that he made the audacious claim that he was the man that Yahweh had sent at the end of an age. And what Reba just read, this is Paul saying, how can he preach except he be sent? Means that you, um, you don't just jump up and volunteer and say, well, you know, I want to be a man of God and um, I'm going to go out and, and teach, right? right. That's, not the, that's not the way that it works. It says, how can you preach except you be sent? Not you, this isn't like a volunteer thing. You don't volunteer. And Dr. Kinley told us that he had ruminated on, you know, that experience. It was said this morning that he got the thing all at once, right? And he said that he didn't think that he was all that bad, that he needed, um, he needed that an experience to that extent that he had received, um, having had received the whole, you know, this whole divine vision and revelation, as he put it, you know, from the whole, saw the whole purpose of Yahweh open up like a giant Japanese fan. And appreciated it from beginning to end. <clears throat> but when he had the vision revelation, he said that a voice said to him, right from within himself, man, what will you do with what, it, what I've shown you? And he said he didn't know the answer to it, right? And as, as he related it, I believe it was three times the question was basically thundered in his conscience. What will you do with what I've shown you? And the answer came right from within himself. Teach your people your will, Yahshua. That is the primary, one of the primary attributes. When we talk about a divine nature, one of the primary attributes of, a, the, of the, the Holy Spirit is that it's a teacher. And that's why when you look at this organization, it's been, it was set up as a school because Dr. Kinley wanted us to know that you go to a school to learn something that you didn't know before. Right. And you come, you go to a, a school with an expectation to learn something. And if you're going to learn, don't you need a teacher? So how are they going to teach except they be sent? And how are you going to believe on something that you don't know anything about? And so back to my point that I just kind of been, and, and Dennis has been on this kick a lot, and it was set up a little bit this morning. This, even though this is a school and there's all this, what looks like knowledge, you know, all this information and all these facts and all these correlations being, you know, poured out in these classes, this is not an academic endeavor where you come down and you believe this thing because it makes intellectual sense to you. Because that is not the type of thing that's going to drive a change within your heart. And so what we just read is, um, read that again in the ninth, uh, Romans 10 and 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that Yahshua is the Messiah and shall believe in thine heart. No, believe with your head. No, your heart. Believe in your heart, not with your head. Because... All of this intellectually can make sense. You know, it reminds me of something that Dr. Killen used to uh, would say 
over in um, First Corinthians, the tenth, I believe it's the tenth chapter, where it says, um, um, "Unless you have believed in vain." Right. Uh, I think that's around the, the fourth verse, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. It says, uh, I, "Moreover, brethren." Oh, actually, you put your right up at one. It's a moreover, brethren. Go ahead. You have that. Yes. First Corinthians ten and one. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea mm -hmm. and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea mm -hmm. did eat all the same spiritual meat yeah. and did all drink the same spiritual drink for that drink of the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was the Messiah. But with right. many of them, Yahweh was not well pleased Right. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. When First Corinthians 15 and 2. Oh, yes, 15 and 2. I totally had you off there. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Rira. 15 and 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So it's possible, he says, to believe in vain, right? But yes. if you go back to that again, start start again, with, and I'm going to interrupt you. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Now he says, I, the gospel that I preached unto you, and which you have received. And Dr. Kinley said, now look, you received it because you couldn't refute it. But that's not the same thing as believing in your heart. And you yes. can see that the, the, the evidence of it, because it's according to the, the scriptures, right, that there would be a great falling away. But many, many, many people that have come down to this class over the years, and some stayed a long time, and even became teachers, and even could run the Law and the Prophets and run these charts. They knew it intellectually so. They received right. it because they couldn't refute it. And they could see how academically this works. But there's a difference between that and having it in your heart. Because when something's in your heart, you know, like Dr. Kelly said, when you catch on to what I'm talking about, you'll die just that way. Right. You know, and many, many, many have, you know, departed the faith. And that's according to, if, if look, if that hadn't happened, then the Bible wouldn't be so. Because that's what it said would happen. And the things that have gone on, even within this institute, many that don't really even appreciate some of the basic fundamental um, things. The, even down to the very purpose that this organization exists. Every time we come down to class, we have, we, we, we have a moderator that gives moderation, and that moderation closes with 10 aims. 10 primary constitutional aims and objectives, right? And the first, the very, very first aim of this school is to help you find and know Yahweh as he really is and actually exists. Now, if you're not endeavoring to try to help someone understand the creator as he really is and actually exists, then how are you in line with the very purpose of what this school is about? Hmm. And I'm saying that to say, and I'm not gonna go off on this tangent, but you know, I just had an opportunity to talk to somebody this week and they were, they've been cut off from, um, uh, mp4s and mp3s and people were even threatened that if they shared the mp4s and mp3s with someone else who wasn't an active member of the school that they would get cut off now how is that trying to help somebody come to a better knowledge and understanding of their creator that's the very purpose of what this school is hmm. and when you see what um, that spirit in a body it's going to operate the same way every time. That's a divine nature. And that divine nature is willing to lay down its life for someone else, that they could come to an, an understanding, a better understanding. And the other thing about it, too, and I'll say a couple more things, then I'll be down. Um, talk about, I said that the, one of the primary attributes of the Holy Spirit is that it's a teacher. Another attribute of the Holy Spirit is that it's a comfort. It's a comforter. The, com the Holy Spirit is a comforter. Mm -hmm. And you know, the whole, the, a lot, the, 
we have a global pandemic going on right now. And a pandemic by its very nature is a, is a communicable disease, you know, that's spread. And you know that the world is by and large in a state of dis-ease, break that word apart, dis-ease. Very exact opposite, you know, of a comfort. And I'll close with, um, if you can go over and get for me, I think in Matthew, the 24th chapter, where it talks about um, where Yahshua said, uh, when you shall therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. And I'll try to come full circle okay. with this. And the efforts that you know keep that uh, you know go into this tabernacle. So yeah, please read that. Matthew twenty four fifteen. I'll pick it up at fourteen. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Mm -hmm. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Now, if you didn't have an understanding of the things that we're gone into this morning, how would you even have context for what you just read? That when you shall see the abomination of desolation right. stand in the holy place. Can you go over, um, Greg, and bring up the tabernacle again? Mm -hmm. There's actually things that you can understand about this. There's the holy place right there. Now, what, what was going on in this holy place? Oh, first yeah. off, first off, there was a table of showbread. Now, all of these things were pointing up to Yahshua the Messiah. Yeah. You have a table of showbread, a, a golden um, a lampstand, you know, and then an altar of incense. And all of three of these things are about Yahshua, by the way. He said that he was the bread of life. Right. Right. And you should be eating of that. The golden candlestick. He said, I am the light of the world. Right? And in this holy place that he said, when you see abomination of desolation, you stand there. There was always light in that holy place. Right. Mm -hmm. And then this altar of incense was where prayers were offered up unto Yahweh. And Yahshua, so there was an intercession going on. Oh, there's so many principles in all of this because, um, you know, by and large, you look out in the world and it's, there's always somebody trying to set themselves up as being the one you need to go to <laughs> for something. I, and they want to be, they want to be your intercessor. Oh, you can't know anything about Yahweh unless you go through me. Now, there was a principle of a man being set up as an intercessor back under that old covenant with, with, with Moses. We just talked about Moses in that tabernacle, right? Moses, um, when Yahweh spoke down from that mount, it thundered and quaked and there was lightning and the people were so scared they couldn't even handle it, right? So they said, we can't handle this. Moses, you go talk to him. Mm -hmm. So, but again, bear in mind, that was another age. That was another dispensation that Moses was allowed to play the role of an intercessor. But there has been a change of covenant. Now, you don't have to go through your dean. You don't have to go through your pope. You don't have to go through <clears throat> your priest. Because there is only one intercessor in this age and dispensation, and that's Yahshua the Messiah himself. And to think right. that you have to go to someone else to get a revelation, a physical man. And that kind of nonsense is taught right here in this institute. People that raised up and to this day want to tell you that unless you go through this individual, you won't know anything about Yahweh. That's showing a complete misunderstanding of something as simple as the ages and dispensations because that, that kind of thing was done away with at the cross. And, but anyway, um, I want to say this and I'll be done, but you see that with that tabernacle in that holy place and you've got um, this lampstand, they would light that at three o'clock in the afternoon and it would burn until nine o'clock in the morning. And so there was always light in this tabernacle, in this, in this holy place. I'm just, revise that because it was always dark in the most holy place but there was always light in this tavern in this holy place and oh there's so many things <laughs> um and i was just saying this because i was thinking about you know the state and condition of the world and how mm -hmm. the world is in such a state of disease yeah you know and you have forces that yahweh put right within your physical body 
that are there to protect you from disease. Mm -hmm. and, and one of those primary things is your immune system. And your immune system is working round the clock, even while you're completely unconscious of it, taking care of invaders that would try to get in and try to, uh, um, um, you know, take over you know, viruses and microbes and all of these things, but you have an immune system. You know that one of the primary things that you need in order to have a healthy immune system, and there's many, many things, but I'm just going to hone in on one and then I really will sit down. Um, vitamin D. All right. And do you know how you get vitamin D, primarily speaking? B in the sun. B in the sun. There is a principle there of being in the sun and literally vitamin, a vitamin being manufactured right within your skin that supports a healthy immune system that can ward off disease. So can you see how that in that holy place, always in the presence of the sun, always light in there. And um, that was a comfort. If you see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place, be in the presence of the sun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that would ward off disease. And I really will shut up now. I really appreciate it, the opportunity to be here. I've really kind of been pricked in my conscience because I feel like um, it's not really always fair. I get to reap the benefits of all the efforts that you all put into showing up here at a certain time and having class. And then I can just tune in on YouTube and watch it later. And it's always, it, it's not really right in my opinion. I'm like, I need to get there more at a certain time. And um, so I really appreciate you guys and everything that you do to keep this gospel being preached and the opportunity to have something to say. And I will uh, yield the floor. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. For our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Dr. Greg Prestis. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> can you hear me all right? Yes. 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 I suppose I should have been expecting that, but I wasn't. Uh, <laughs> But I, as everyone has said, I do appreciate the opportunity to um, share something of what Yahshua has allowed me to see. Uh, we've certainly had um, a good introduction and overview of this teaching this morning. So uh, I will attempt to just carry on. Uh, looks like we've got about 23 minutes. So, uh, boy, let's, let's just go back um, to the scripture reading and uh, kind of regroup and pick up, carry on. Uh, From Romans 1.16? Yes, please. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of the Messiah, for it is the power of Yahweh unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. Or therein, yeah, keep going, sorry. For therein is the righteousness of Yahweh revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Okay, so, you know, right away, this is, this is different than the impression that people normally have of what's in the Bible, what's involved in worshiping God, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to let just Sharon read through and then go back and just pick up a couple of things and attempt to tie in with the information that the previous speakers have put out. And hopefully someone can come away with just a clear impression um, that there really is a God and that everything that's going on today and everything that's going on in our life uh, is really part of a deliberate and specific purpose that, that Yahweh has, that there is a God, he has a name, and things have not run amok, things are not out of control. It's just that his purpose is different than what we might ordinarily think and what we've been told and so on. So go ahead, reread that and keep going, Sharon, please. Start at 16? Yeah. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of the Messiah, 
For it is the power of Yahweh unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of Yahweh revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of Yahweh is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, for Yahweh has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Okay, so <clears throat> that's a mouthful there. And, you know, if we can come away of, uh, from this class with even uh, a partial understanding of what Paul's talking about, then um, I would say that it's, it's been successful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so many things have already been expressed. So, uh, you know, just consider all those things reiterated as, as we work back through this. Now, um, I'm going to, I want to do it sort of in reverse order because like I say, I mean, this has already been explained, but you know, there's not a one of us that pick up on everything uh, the first time, uh, let alone in some ways we'll never have, uh, you know, just have understood so much about this that we're just sort of done and waiting for something new. Now, uh, so get Romans 1, 19 and 20, reread that. Uh, and, you know, I am being repetitive. And the thing is, this is a school and we just want everyone to walk away having understood something about, not so much about what we've said, but about what Yahweh uh, has shown us through, um, through our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, and through the propagation of this teaching. So uh, Romans 1, 19 and 20. Romans 1, 19, because that which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, for Yahweh has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Okay. He so uh, even as eternal power and supernal nature, so that they are without excuse. I'm sorry I cut you off there. So that's, that's been explained today. Again, not in totality, but we've had a very good introduction to this tabernacle pattern that Yahweh revealed to Moses in his vision and caused Moses to build in the wilderness of Sinai. And See, really, this tabernacle in the Bible, and it's already been mentioned how it was shown to Moses 3,500 years ago, this tabernacle functions as a witness to the fact that there really is a God. Right. Because um, as it's been pointed out, uh, you're not reading in, in uh you know, Moses talking about an atom and a proton and a neutron and an electron. This is something that science has, an understanding scientists have developed relatively recently. But this tabernacle pattern that Moses did write about is showing you a, two, a structure. And to get into just a little bit of detail uh, as way of review, the, the holy place and most holy place were one structure bars, uh, wooden, wooden boards covered with gold. It was a very solid structure. And that structure was divided by a veil into a most holy place and a holy place. And then that dense structure, also referred to as the sanctuary, was surrounded by a court. And then in that court or the court round about the sanctuary, mm. there were the altar and the laver and the anointing oil. So when we slide that over to the atom, atom is threefold. Atoms are constructed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. But you see the protons and the neutrons 
clump together in the center of what's called the nucleus of the atom. And then they're, sur they're surrounded by what's called the electron shell and also the electron cloud. So you have the sanctuary of the nucleus of the atom in the midst of a cloud. And um, it's already been explained about the cell and so on. But what, what I'm just reviewing is the fact that this is showing you that whoever was dealing with Moses and gave Moses the vision of this tabernacle knew something about the atom and the cell and mankind's knowledge of such things was not developed at that point. So through the operation of the Holy Spirit, this knowledge of a structure and the reading the Bible about a tabernacle, you see, that's actually a witness to the fact that there is an intelligence that's greater than man's intelligence. And there is a consciousness that's not limited to time so that, um, we can come to understand that there is a God and that he has a purpose through the things that are made. And now um, when we talk about the tabernacle, that's something that Yahweh told Moses to construct. So man made this tabernacle, but it was according to a divine pattern. But then when we talk about Elohim, the archetype original pattern of the universe, you see, man did not create the universe, Yahweh created the universe. So whether it's things that are made according by man, according to Yahweh's instructions, or things that Yahweh made himself, they're all showing forth the fact that um, there is a God and that he's operating by a, by a purpose. Now, um, let's go back to Romans 1.16, and uh, let me just touch on, on this a little bit. And as, as the previous speakers have already emphasized, um, we're sharing this information not so much because we want to be an expert in the Bible or an expert in science, or we want you to be an expert in the Bible or an expert in science. The things that we learn about in science and the things that are written in the Bible, those are Yahweh's witnesses to the fact that there really is a God and that he does have a purpose. And when we understand that, that understanding in our hearts and in our minds, as has already been pointed out, that has the potential to transform our inner uh, existence, our inner state from one of fear, one of confusion, one of, um, in some cases, terror, and so on. Through having faith in the operation of Yahweh's purpose, that allows us to be at peace and to have an understanding of what's going on and not to be in a state of doubt and confusion. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, we're running out of time, which is always the case. Uh, before we get Romans 1.16, I, I just want to get, um, I think it's Hebrews, is it 11 and 6? Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is the other thing, is that the Bible, to me, you know, there were church people and religious people carrying this Bible around, and I never, uh, you know, after leaving home and never going back to the Roman Catholic Church on my own again, um, I never expected the Bible uh, to have any meaning whatsoever. But, uh, you know, as, as I'm, we're just repeating, the Bible is actually Yahweh's way of informing us that he does exist. And so there's a validity, there, there are principles and spiritual principles in the Bible that um, are important and have nothing to do with going to church and being a good Catholic or being a good Christian. It has to do with really knowing that Yahweh exists and understanding that he has a purpose. And it's the understanding of his purpose that allows us to be at peace even today in 2020 
while we see social media and all these other influences bringing about a very chaotic condition. We see these fires in California. We see the pandemic. We see all this trouble in the world, but internally we can be at rest and at peace in the knowledge of our creator. Now, uh, please get that in, in Hebrews, please. Hebrews 11 and 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to Yahweh must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, there's a lot of organizations uh, that talk about faith. But, um, and, and we have faith-based religions and faith-based organizations, and many, many people talk about having faith. And if you look it up in the dictionary, there's religious definitions, which essentially means believing something that you have no uh, evidence of or no understanding of. And so when someone says, just take it by faith, basically just accept it, even though um, I can't prove it and you don't understand it. But if we actually look in the dictionary, faith is synonymous with trust and confidence. <clears throat> and that includes belief, but belief in the sense that um, you understand something as being real and true. And, you know, the value of truth is being emphasized in our world today by its absence. And the fact, you know, people have their own facts and it's many people are almost of the opinion that, well, I believe what I believe and you believe what you believe, but you really can't prove anything. But as it's what we've attempted to show today is that the things that are in the Bible, the way the physical creation operates, even as it's um, testified to by modern day science, that all provides the witnesses and the evidence and the basis for actually believing that there is a God and knowing it within ourselves and not being subject to someone else's opinion about it. And as has also been evidenced, the, uh, been mentioned, the final evidence of that is when we see these divine attributes of our creator, divine intelligence, wisdom, and knowledge, divine beauty, love, justice, divine foundation and power and strength actually taking on shape and form within us and allowing us to be at peace in the midst of a very chaotic and troubling world. Now, um, so they must believe that he is and read. And that he is rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay. So again, you know, this is a huge subject and we have these classes uh, all over the country many times a week and many of us have been attending these classes for decades and there's not a one of us that has reached the end, end of it. But uh, so, it, you know, it's already been explained about this tabernacle, how there was a court round about a holy place and a most holy place. And it's already been shown and it discussed in the moderation how um, children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt and Yahweh brought in that ninth plague was, which was a plague of darkness. And um, if you equate darkness with ignorance, then you can see that the entire world that we're in today is, is uh, descending into a state of darkness and it is in a state of ignorance relative to the existence of our creator. Now, uh, Romans 1 and 16, please. Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of the Messiah, for it is the power of Yahweh unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. So this is what we'll, we'll end with today. And uh, let's, let's go back over to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. And this is yet another aspect of the witnesses that Yahweh has, has laid 
painstakingly and in great detail in the scriptures. Now, you know, I don't think there's a, not too many people alive on earth who haven't heard about Jesus Christ, which the moderator explained that when that man actually walked on the earth, being a Hebrew or a Jew, <clears throat> his name was not Jesus, but his name was Yahshua. And so we use the correct name in this teaching as it was explained to us by our founder, Dr. Henry <coughs> Now go ahead uh, and read 1 Corinthians, please. 15 and one. Yes, please. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. See, and the previous speakers were talking about, where this is not just information, but this information will have an effect on our very lives and our very hearts and our very nature and our very uh, relationship with being alive. Because through the preaching of the gospel, we become convinced that Yahweh, there really is a God and that he really does have a purpose and that all the chaos and confusion in the world, all the troubles and trials and difficulties that we have to deal with in our own physical lives, all of that uh, serves a purpose. And see, it's all operating according to a pattern and this pattern, this tabernacle pattern, see, it just repeats. It repeats in the creation as we've been shown today, and it repeats in all these biblical stories, uh, so-called stories. And, and in every case, it's showing us the same message, that you have a state of bondage or darkness or death, that you're uh, buried or immersed, held in bondage in that state, and that through the operation of the Spirit, there is a resurrection. Okay, uh, go ahead, read, please. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Yahshua died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, Yahshua, see, it's not just some man on the cross. His death on the cross was actually predicated, predicted, and described uh, by the writings of Moses and, and by the writings of the prophets. Mm -hmm. Well, how is that? Well, you see, in order for... E Israel to be delivered from Egypt, they had to offer up a lamb. And John the Baptist, when Yahshua came to John to be baptized of him, John said, uh, behold the lamb of Yahweh who takes away the sins of the world. After Yahshua came back and it was revealed to John that he was the Messiah. Now the lamb was killed. There were four points of blood on the door in Egypt. And see, these are all these details, and the details aren't important, except that it just shows how these events that were happening, this is 1,500 years before Yahshua was born, and we're now 2,020 years after, and yet everything is still operating the same way. And see, that's evidence that there is a God. So Yahshua was the lamb. He's crucified, crown of thorns, nails in each hand nailed through the feet, four points of blood of the lamb. He said he was the door in Egypt. You had the blood of the lamb put on the door, uh, the top of the door of the two side posts dipping out of the basin. There are numerous other examples, but you see that showing how Yahshua died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then as right. we've talked about in the pattern, every day there was sacrifices offered up. They put the blood of the sacrifice on the four horns of the altar and that sacrifice was there for the remission or the forgiveness of sins that was culminated on the day of atonement so see Yahshua died for our sins according to the scriptures uh go ahead and that he was buried and that well, he, he rose was buried say they put him in Joseph's new tomb Israel went into uh the Red Sea and the sacrifice after it was slain, it was immersed in the labor in order to be cleansed. So there's a burial, read. 
and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. See, now we have trouble believing. People think that's a fairy tale, that a man could be live and die and then resurrect. But that's the message. Yahshua resurrected from the dead. Israel was delivered from the bondage. Now, um... Oh, I don't, I don't know where this is. It might be Colossians 2.8. We don't have time to get it, but it says that you are risen through faith in the operation of Yahweh. So if we can see Yahweh operating his purpose by this pattern over and over and over again, you see, then here we are in the darkness and ignorance and confusion and also the trouble and the toil and turmoil of this world. And just as Moses was sent down here to preach deliverance to the Israelites, and just as Yahshua, it's written, uh, went down into the grave and preached deliverance to the captives. See, through the preaching of the gospel, through the death, burial, resurrection, through the preaching of the tabernacle pattern, through the demonstration of these witnesses. See, that's entering into the darkness and the chaos and the confusion of our own minds. And Colossians 2.12, Greg. What's that? Colossians 2.12. Okay, I, I'm afraid I don't have time to get it, but thanks for throwing that out. Um, everyone can, can, can get that, because I'm on fumes right now. I'm, I'm actually 20 <laughs> seconds over, so I've got to wrap this up, but thank you. So, you see, we uh, tell you what, get that. We'll end with that. Thanks, Ricky. Colossians 2.12. Colossians 2.12. Buried with him in baptism wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of Yahweh, who has raised him from the dead. So you see, we, and this isn't just ancient history, we are dead in our ignorance and in our doubt and in our confusion and in our pain and in our trials and our tribulations. And through mm -hmm. the preaching of the gospel, you see, that's as it were a baptism. We're baptized in the name. We're baptized in the gospel. We're baptized in the truth. And through that brings about a knowledge and a convinces us that there is a Yahweh and that we have faith in his operation. And through that faith, we're then resurrected from that state of darkness into uh, a state of uh, light and knowledge and understanding. Uh, as Keith had talked about, you see, that's a quickening. Now, Romans 14, 17, and I'll be finished, please. So the children of Israel eventually they were delivered out of Egypt. They spent 40 years in the wilderness where that first generation uh, actually died off and there was a new birth. A second generation was born. Israel was born again in the wilderness. And it's that second generation that went on to inherit uh, Canaan's land and establish the kingdom of Israel. So we talk about going to heaven and we talk about the kingdom of heaven. But you see, through this preaching of the gospel, we're delivered from doubt and confusion into the light and knowledge that there is a Yahweh, there is a God, he has a purpose. And through that knowledge, through the Holy Spirit, through that quickening, we are entered into the kingdom of heaven now internally. And uh, read fourteen seventeen, please. For the kingdom of Yahweh is not meat and drink, but righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. See, that's the kingdom of heaven. And uh, as it talked about in Romans, that he's revealing his righteousness and his nature. And so in a very brief fashion today, that's what we've tried to share is how there is a God, he has a purpose, and our understanding of his purpose, our faith in the gospel that he's established with these witnesses in the science and in the Bible delivers us from darkness, delivers us from bondage, and brings us into the kingdom of heaven, which is righteousness, peace, and joy. And we can be there now, even the midst, in the midst of COVID-19 and presidential elections and terrible fires and catastrophes. Right. Uh, I hope I hope that we were able and I was able to communicate something of the glory and the beauty and the value and the, the tremendous grace that we've received through uh, being made aware of uh, Yahweh's gospel. Um, and so with that, 
Thank you for your time and patience. Uh, all praises be to Yahweh through Yahshua. And I turn it back to the moderator. Thank you, Greg. I'll be reading, the, we'll be having the doxology now. It's in the in last two verses of Jude in the Holy Name Bible. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and ever. Let us all say in unity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.